In the pantheon of the video game industry, a few names echo louder than others, weaving stories of innovation, creativity, and sheer entertainment. Among these legendary names, Nintendo stands out, a testament to the transformative power of play. This video explores the rich tapestry of Nintendo's history, an epic saga that unfolds over a century and whose impact reverberates through the annals of entertainment. We begin in 1889, with the birth of a card game company in Kyoto, Japan, an entity that would evolve, adapt, and rise to become a global powerhouse in the world of video games. From its humble beginnings as Nintendo Kopai, crafting handmade Hanafuda cards, we follow the company as it diversifies its interests, forays into the realm of toys, and eventually stumbles upon the formula that would catapult it to international fame. The narrative threads wind through the arcades of the 1970s, into the era of home consoles, and the birth of iconic franchises such as Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, and Pokemon. We explore the innovations that defined each generation, the intuitive D-pad, the tactile Game Boy, the revolutionary Wii motion controls, and the boundary-blurring Switch, each milestone an emblem of Nintendo's inventiveness. Along the way, we encounter visionaries like Gunpei Yokoi and Shigeru Miyamoto, creative forces who redefine not just Nintendo, but the entire landscape of video games. This is not merely a chronicle of products and profits, but a tale of risk and reward, of daring to dream and defying the odds. It's an exploration of how Nintendo, in its quest to provide interactive entertainment, has shaped, disrupted, and ultimately defined the video game industry. Join us on this journey through time as we delve into the captivating world of Nintendo, the triumphs, the challenges, the breakthroughs, and the legacy, because to understand Nintendo is to understand the evolution of digital entertainment itself. Chapter 1, The Founding of Nintendo, A Look Back to 1889. Nintendo's journey started in the bustling city of Kyoto, Japan. Kyoto, with its rich cultural history and its blend of tradition and modernity, would later come to mirror Nintendo's ethos in its products. In the late 19th century, card games had become a staple form of entertainment in Japan. Many variants of playing cards were imported from Europe, but these foreign decks weren't wholly compatible with traditional Japanese games. This gap in the market provided an opportunity for a young entrepreneur named Fusajiro Yamauchi, Yamauchi established Nintendo Kopai on September 23, 1889. The company's name, Nintendo, was an amalgamation of three kanji characters, Nin, Ten, and Du, which loosely translated meant leave luck to heaven. A fitting name for a company that would, in the future, gamble on innovative ideas in the entertainment industry. Nintendo Kopai's first product was a deck of handmade Hanafuda, a type of playing card used for a variety of games in Japan. These cards differed from Western ones as they used illustrations instead of numbers. A typical Hanafuda deck consisted of 48 cards divided into 12 suits, each representing a month and associated with a particular plant or flower. Yamauchi's Hanafuda cards were crafted using Mitsumata bark and painted with exquisite designs. They quickly gained popularity due to their high-quality craftsmanship, intricate designs, and the immersive gameplay they offered. The popularity of these decks grew so rapidly that Yamauchi had to hire assistants to mass-produce cards to meet the demand, a stark contrast to their initial handmade production. Despite gambling being somewhat looked down upon by Japanese authorities, Nintendo Kopai prospered. The company was granted a special status as the official purveyor of playing cards to the imperial household, an honor that bolstered its standing in the industry and among the general populace. This unique position allowed Nintendo Kopai to continue its operations, even during periods when card games faced heavy restrictions and bans. The flourishing business led to the opening of a new Nintendo Kopai branch in Osaka in 1902, marking the first significant expansion of the company. Here, they ventured into the production of Western-style playing cards, adapting to the tastes of an increasingly Western-influenced Japanese population. The company continued to thrive, firmly establishing itself as a major player in the playing card industry. By the time Fusajiro Yamauchi retired in 1929, Nintendo Kopai was a well-established and respected company. His adopted son-in-law, Sekiryo Kaneda, later Yamauchi, took the reins. This transition would mark the beginning of new chapters in Nintendo's history, leading it from being a successful playing card company to a global powerhouse in the entertainment industry. 
This first chapter of Nintendo's journey laid the foundations of a company ethos that endures to this day. At its core, Nintendo has always strived to deliver high-quality, captivating products. From Fusajiro Yamauchi's intricate Hanafuda cards to the immersive worlds of Mario and Link, this commitment to excellence in entertainment remains the guiding principle of Nintendo. Chapter 2. The Early Years Hanafuda Cards and the Card Game Industry In the wake of Fusajiro Yamauchi's retirement in 1929, the stewardship of Nintendo Kopai fell into the capable hands of Sekiryo Yamauchi, Yamauchi's son-in-law. Continuing the family tradition, Sekiryo maintained the company's focus on producing quality playing cards, expanding the business, and solidifying its reputation in the marketplace. Under Sekiryo's guidance, Nintendo Kopai continued its growth, quickly becoming a significant player in the Japanese playing card industry. While Hanafuda remained the company's cornerstone product, Sekiryo expanded the range to include various types of traditional and Western-style cards, catering to an increasingly diversified clientele. The 1930s and 1940s saw Nintendo navigating through turbulent waters. Japan was on a war path, and the subsequent years of World War II caused severe disruption to businesses nationwide. Despite the challenging circumstances, Nintendo managed to stay afloat, due in part to its focus on entertainment products, which provided a means of escape and amusement in a time of uncertainty. After the end of the war, the company faced a series of restrictive gambling laws passed by the Allied Occupation Forces, which severely limited the card game industry. Nintendo adapted to these restrictions, producing cards for non-gambling games and educational cards for children. In 1947, Sekiryo established a new distribution company named Marufuku Company to manage the increasingly complicated logistics of Nintendo Kopai's widespread distribution. This entity was responsible for managing the sales and distribution of the playing cards to a network of stores throughout Japan. In 1951, Hiroshi Yamauchi, Sekiryo's grandson, assumed leadership of the company after Sekiryo's death. A visionary and a strong-willed businessman, Hiroshi would lead Nintendo into a new era of innovation, growth, and diversification, marking the beginning of its transformation from a card company into an entertainment behemoth. Under Hiroshi's leadership, the company changed its name from Nintendo Kopai to Nintendo Playing Card Company in 1951, signifying its primary business at the time. A crucial milestone during Hiroshi's early tenure was the 1953 introduction of plastic playing cards in Japan, which were more durable and easier to shuffle than the traditional paper cards. This innovation set a new standard in the playing card industry, further solidifying Nintendo's dominance in the marketplace. Despite these successful years, Hiroshi Yamauchi soon realized that the playing card business had its limitations. In 1963, the company underwent another name change, this time to Nintendo Company, dropping the playing card to signify its intention to diversify into new business avenues. From these humble beginnings, a pattern starts to emerge that will become the backbone of Nintendo's success story, a relentless focus on quality, the courage to innovate, and the readiness to adapt to the changing times. These attributes would be tested and proven true time and again as Nintendo stepped into new territories in the decades to come. Chapter 3 Diversification, taxicabs, love hotels, and TV networks. Having realized the limitations of the playing card industry, Hiroshi Yamauchi sought to diversify Nintendo's portfolio. In the mid-1960s, Nintendo ventured into several unconventional business areas, reflecting the company's willingness to experiment and take risks. In 1963, the company established a taxi company named Daya. At the time, labor union disputes were common in the taxi industry. But Yamauchi successfully negotiated a favorable deal with the union, ensuring smooth operations for Daya. Although the taxi service was initially successful, it was not a sustainable venture for Nintendo and was eventually sold off. Along with the taxi company, Nintendo also delved into the hotel industry, launching a chain of love hotels. These short-stay accommodations, often rented by the hour, were designed with privacy in mind and were a popular facet of Japanese city life. Despite their widespread acceptance and popularity, Nintendo's love hotels did not prove to be a successful venture. During this period, Nintendo also ventured into the realm of instant rice, similar to instant noodles, a staple food item in Japan. This endeavor, unfortunately, did not take off as hoped and was quickly discontinued due to stiff competition and lack of consumer interest. 
Another unique venture during this diversification phase was the establishment of a television network. Although the network had some success, it was not the breakout hit Nintendo was looking for. Ultimately, like the taxi service, love hotels, and instant rice, the TV network did not align with Nintendo's core strengths and was eventually sold. Despite the initial lack of long-term success, these diversification efforts were far from failures. They provided Nintendo with valuable business lessons and, more importantly, highlighted the need for the company to leverage its unique strengths, innovation, creativity, and a knack for entertainment. Around the same time, a new form of entertainment was emerging, one that merged technology with amusement. Video games were quickly gaining popularity in the Western world. Hiroshi Yamauchi saw potential in this new industry, recognizing that it aligned well with Nintendo's existing expertise in crafting entertaining experiences. In 1966, the company took its first step into the realm of toys and games, setting the stage for Nintendo's future as a gaming industry powerhouse. Nintendo's foray into the taxi, hotel, food, and television industries, though short-lived, was instrumental in shaping the company's trajectory. These ventures may have been economic missteps, but they helped clarify Nintendo's mission and focus, eventually leading the company back to its roots, creating unique and compelling forms of entertainment. Chapter 4. Entering the Toy Industry, Ultra Hand and Love Tester In the midst of exploring various business ventures, Hiroshi Yamauchi recognized a promising opportunity in a booming industry of the time, toys. Seeing the potential for growth and aligning with Nintendo's core competency in entertainment, he steered the company into the realm of toy manufacturing in 1966. One of the crucial figures in this transition was Gunpei Yokoi, an engineer who was initially hired to maintain the assembly line machines used to manufacture playing cards. Yokoi's first notable contribution came when he created a simple extending arm toy during his spare time, a device that would become the Ultra Hand. When Yamauchi discovered the Ultra Hand, he immediately saw its potential. He decided to mass produce the toy, which turned out to be a big success, selling over a million units. The Ultra Hand was Nintendo's first step into the toy industry, and it marked the beginning of Gunpei Yokoi's influential career in the company, which would later lead to the creation of the Game Boy and other famous Nintendo products. Nintendo continued its toy-making venture, producing a variety of toys, board games, and light gun games. One notable creation during this era was the Love Tester, another Gunpei Yokoi invention. The Love Tester was a novelty toy that supposedly measured the love between two people who held the device while holding hands. Despite its pseudo-scientific premise, the Love Tester became a popular product, embodying Nintendo's knack for creating engaging and entertaining products. The success of the Ultra Hand and the Love Tester allowed Nintendo to carve a niche in the toy industry. However, the company faced fierce competition from larger, more established toy manufacturers. While these early toy-making efforts provided a new business avenue, they did not yield the level of success that Yamauchi sought. Around this time, a significant shift was taking place in the entertainment industry. With the advent of electronic technology and video arcade games, the landscape of the entertainment sector was changing. The potential of electronic entertainment was not lost on Yamauchi. He saw an opportunity to leverage Nintendo's creativity and experience in entertainment, propelling the company towards its destiny. The early foray into the toy industry set the stage for Nintendo's subsequent pivot to electronic games. This period was crucial in shaping Nintendo's creative culture, fostering talents like Gunpei Yokoi, and setting the precedent for innovative, fun, and successful products that would become the company's trademark. With a new direction in sight, Nintendo stood at the brink of a revolution, ready to transform the world of entertainment forever. Chapter 5. The Game & Watch Era – Pioneering Portable Gaming With its foot in the door of the toy industry and an eye on the burgeoning video game market, Nintendo found itself in an era of experimentation and innovation. As the 1970s rolled on, one revolutionary device would propel the company into the global market, the Game & Watch. The birth of the Game & Watch was as much a stroke of inspiration as it was an observation. The concept came to Gunpei Yokoi, now a key figure in Nintendo's product development during a train ride. He noticed a bored businessman playing with an LCD calculator to pass the time. The sight sparked an idea in Yokoi's mind, a vision of a watch that could double as a miniature gaming device, offering a unique form of portable entertainment. Launched in 1980, the first Game & Watch device was called Ball. It was a simple game where players juggled balls in the air. 
using buttons to control the movement of the character's arms. Despite its simplicity, Ball was a success. The combination of engaging gameplay, portability, and the dual function as a clock made the Game & Watch a hit product. The Game & Watch series would eventually span 59 different models, each with its own unique game. Titles included Fire, Manhole, Chef, Mario Brothers, Zelda, and many others. Many of these games had a Game A and Game B mode, with Game B usually being a faster, more challenging version of Game A. Apart from popularizing handheld gaming, the Game & Watch series also introduced several key innovations that would become standard in the gaming industry. The most notable of these was the plus-shaped directional control pad, or D-pad, introduced in the Donkey Kong Game & Watch. This simple yet effective control mechanism would become a staple in virtually all of Nintendo's future gaming devices and the industry at large. The Game & Watch devices were also pioneers in terms of incorporating gaming elements into everyday devices, a theme that Nintendo would revisit time and again in its product lineup. The notion of killing time with a gaming device was born with the Game & Watch, and it laid the groundwork for Nintendo's future success in portable gaming. During its run from 1980 to 1991, over 43 million units of Game & Watch were sold worldwide. The series' success firmly established Nintendo's reputation as an innovator in the video game industry. With a hit product under its belt and invaluable experience gained, Nintendo was poised to delve deeper into the rapidly growing world of video games. The Game & Watch era was not just about a series of successful products. It was a crucial stepping stone that marked Nintendo's transition from a traditional toy company to a video game industry leader. Chapter 6. Shigeru Miyamoto, A Legend is Born In the realm of video games, few names command as much respect and admiration as Shigeru Miyamoto. Known as the father of modern video gaming, Miyamoto's creative genius has shaped many of Nintendo's most iconic franchises. But how did this legend get his start? Shigeru Miyamoto was born on November 16, 1952, in the small town of Sonobe, Japan. Growing up, he was an imaginative and adventurous child. He would often explore the countryside, making maps and sketches of his surroundings. These childhood experiences, particularly the discovery of a hidden cave during one of his explorations, would later inspire some of his most famous game designs. Miyamoto joined Nintendo in 1977, initially hired as a staff artist. His knack for creative storytelling and design quickly caught the eye of then-president Hiroshi Yamauchi. When the company faced a potential crisis in 1980, with unsold arcade units for a game called Radar Scope, Yamauchi turned to Miyamoto. Tasked with turning the Radar Scope units into a new, more engaging game, Miyamoto conceived Donkey Kong. Released in 1981, Donkey Kong was an instant success, revitalizing Nintendo's arcade game business and introducing the world to the now iconic characters of Donkey Kong and Mario. But Miyamoto's impact went beyond creating popular characters. His approach to game design was revolutionary. He prioritized the gameplay and storytelling aspects over points, emphasizing the player's experience and the joy of exploration and discovery. Miyamoto was instrumental in creating some of the most influential franchises in gaming history, including The Legend of Zelda, Super Mario Bros., Star Fox, and Pikmin, to name a few. Each game bore his unique touch, showcasing immersive worlds, creative gameplay mechanics, and memorable characters. His philosophy of designing games that are accessible, enjoyable, and based on unique ideas continues to be at the heart of Nintendo's approach to game development. His dedication to innovation and creating joyful experiences has not only influenced Nintendo, but has also set standards for the global video game industry. Throughout his career, Miyamoto has received numerous awards and honors, including a BAFTA Fellowship, the Game Developer's Choice Lifetime Achievement Award, and induction into the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. Shigeru Miyamoto's creativity, passion, and commitment to delivering enjoyable experiences have left an indelible mark on Nintendo and the entire gaming industry. From exploring caves as a child to creating worlds that millions explore on their consoles, Miyamoto's journey is a testament to the power of imagination and the joy of play. Chapter 7, Donkey Kong, The Birth of an Icon. As the early 1980s arrived, Nintendo was just beginning to navigate the rapidly evolving landscape of video gaming. It was during this crucial period that a new arcade game would not only become a global sensation, but also lay the foundation for Nintendo's future successes. That game was Donkey Kong. 
Released in 1981, Donkey Kong was unlike any other arcade game at the time. The game's narrative involved a character named Jumpman, later known as Mario, who must climb ladders and avoid obstacles to rescue his girlfriend Pauline from the eponymous ape Donkey Kong. The game showcased several innovative elements, setting it apart from other games of the era. Unlike many contemporary titles that focused on getting points, Donkey Kong emphasized completing levels and advancing the narrative. This focus on progression and storytelling was a departure from the norm and marked a significant shift in the design of video games. Donkey Kong was also the first game to feature the character Mario, who would become Nintendo's mascot and star in the company's most successful franchise. Though Mario was a simple character in Donkey Kong, his design and character would evolve in subsequent games, eventually becoming the mustachioed plumber known and loved worldwide. The release of Donkey Kong was a pivotal moment for Nintendo. The game was a commercial success, selling over 60,000 arcade units in the United States alone and effectively saving Nintendo's North American operations. It marked the company's entry into the global video game market and established its reputation for innovative, narrative-driven games. Donkey Kong's success also paved the way for the rise of Shigeru Miyamoto. His approach to game design, prioritizing fun gameplay and storytelling, would define Nintendo's philosophy for decades to come. Donkey Kong was more than just a popular game. It was the first step on the road to Nintendo becoming a household name in video gaming. Chapter 8. Nintendo Entertainment System, Revolutionizing the Home Console Market The mid-1980s was a tumultuous time in the video game industry. Following a massive market crash in 1983, consumer faith in video games was at an all-time low. Amid this crisis, Nintendo made a bold move that would not only revitalize the industry, but redefine home entertainment, the launch of the Nintendo Entertainment System. The NES, known as the Famicom, short for Family Computer in Japan, was first released in its home country in 1983. It was Nintendo's first attempt at a cartridge-based home video game console, inspired by the success of their Game & Watch handheld devices. Designed by Masayuki Uemura, the system was a significant departure from the simple design of earlier consoles, offering improved graphics, enhanced sound capabilities, and a vast library of games. However, the NES's journey to success was not without its challenges. After a botched launch due to a faulty chipset, the Famicom was pulled from the shelves and reissued with a new reliable chipset. Despite this early setback, the console quickly gained popularity in Japan, thanks to its impressive games library and superior technology. The real test, however, was breaking into the North American market. After the video game crash of 1983, many retailers were wary of stocking new video game consoles. Undeterred, Nintendo revamped the Famicom's design, transforming it into the gray, boxy console known as the NES for its North American debut in 1985. Nintendo utilized a unique strategy to counter the negative perceptions of the video game industry. They marketed the NES as an entertainment system rather than a video game console, and packaged it with peripherals like the robotic operating buddy, Rob, and games like Duck Hunt to present it as a toy or home entertainment device. The NES also came bundled with Super Mario Brothers, a game that would become a cultural phenomenon. The success of Super Mario Brothers, along with other titles such as The Legend of Zelda and Metroid, played a significant role in the NES's popularity. By the end of the 1980s, the NES had sold millions of units worldwide, and Nintendo had single-handedly revitalized the video game industry. It was more than just a successful product, it was a beacon of innovation that marked a new era in home entertainment. The NES's legacy is evident in its enduring popularity, and the continued influence of the franchises it launched. Its introduction of a gamepad controller with a D-pad, a standard in today's consoles, showcases the system's impact on video game design. As the console that redefined gaming and restored faith in the video game industry, the NES holds a significant place in Nintendo's history and the wider world of video games. Chapter 9. Super Mario Bros. The Mustachioed Plumber Who Changed Gaming In the storied history of video games, there are few characters as iconic and universally recognized as Mario. The Mustachioed Plumber made his first appearance in the arcade game Donkey Kong in 1981, but it was the release of Super Mario Bros. on the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 that solidified his status as a gaming legend and 
forever change the landscape of video games. Super Mario Bros. was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka, with Koji Kondo providing the memorable soundtrack. The game was initially released in Japan and later packaged with the NES for its North American launch. The premise of the game was simple. Players controlled Mario, or his brother Luigi in two-player mode, through the Mushroom Kingdom to rescue Princess Peach from the villainous Bowser. Along the way, they would navigate various landscapes, avoid or defeat enemies, and collect power-ups like the Super Mushroom and Fire Flower. Super Mario Brothers introduced several revolutionary elements to the gaming world. Its design was a leap forward in terms of complexity and scope. The game consisted of eight worlds, each with four levels, a vast expanse compared to previous platformers. Moreover, Super Mario Brothers was a pioneer of the side-scrolling genre. The screen would move along with Mario, opening up new areas of the game world as he advanced, providing players with a sense of depth and exploration. This design mechanic was a significant innovation, influencing countless games that followed. Perhaps the most enduring legacy of Super Mario Brothers is its impact on video game narrative. While the game's story was simple, it introduced the concept of an overarching narrative to the platform genre, giving players a purpose beyond just getting a high score. Super Mario Brothers was a phenomenal success, selling over 40 million copies and becoming a defining title for the NES. Its impact resonated beyond sales figures, shaping the future of the platform genre and influencing generations of games and developers. The legacy of Super Mario Brothers is evident in the numerous sequels, spin-offs, and adaptations it has spawned, each carrying forward the original game's spirit of fun, exploration, and innovation. Today, Mario remains the face of Nintendo, a testament to the enduring appeal of a simple plumber on a grand adventure. Chapter 10, The Legend of Zelda, Crafting an Epic Fantasy Adventure. If Super Mario Brothers marked Nintendo's mastery of the platform genre, The Legend of Zelda showcased the company's ability to craft a captivating action-adventure game. Released in 1986 for the Nintendo Entertainment System, The Legend of Zelda introduced players to the expansive world of Hyrule and its courageous hero, Link. The Legend of Zelda was the brainchild of Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka, who sought to create a game that encapsulated the sense of exploration and adventure Miyamoto felt while exploring forests and caves as a child. The game's composer, Koji Kondo, complemented this vision with an iconic soundtrack that still resonates with gamers today. The game challenged players to take on the role of Link, a young adventurer tasked with rescuing Princess Zelda from the evil Ganon and retrieving the fragmented Triforce of Wisdom. To achieve this goal, players had to navigate through the vast overworld of Hyrule and its numerous dungeons, solving puzzles, defeating enemies, and collecting items along the way. What set The Legend of Zelda apart from other games of its time was its non-linear gameplay. Players could explore Hyrule at their own pace and in any order, an unusual feature for games of that era. This open-ended approach encouraged exploration and rewarded curiosity, creating a more immersive and engaging gaming experience. The game was also notable for its use of a battery backup system to save progress, a novel feature for console games. This allowed players to undertake the lengthy adventure at their own pace, a significant departure from games that required completion in a single sitting. The Legend of Zelda was a commercial and critical success, lauded for its expansive world, immersive gameplay, and the depth of its storytelling. It has since become one of the most influential video games of all time, giving birth to a beloved franchise and setting the standard for future action-adventure games. The game's legacy is reflected in its numerous sequels and spin-offs, each expanding on the rich lore and complex game mechanics of the original. As a pillar of Nintendo's gaming lineup, The Legend of Zelda continues to captivate players with its blend of adventure, exploration, and puzzle solving, affirming its place in video game history. Chapter 11, Metroid, Introducing Samus Aran. In the golden age of the Nintendo Entertainment System, a new game arrived that brought an element of science fiction horror to the platform. In 1986, the same year that The Legend of Zelda was released, Nintendo launched Metroid, a game that would go on to define a unique subgenre of its own and introduce one of gaming's most iconic heroines, Samus Aran. Metroid, 
designed by Makoto Kano and directed by Satoru Okada and Yoshio Sakamoto, combined elements of platforming, exploration, and action-adventure in a haunting, alien world. The game was heavily influenced by Ridley Scott's 1979 science fiction film Alien, both in its atmospheric tension and in its design aesthetics. Players were cast as Samus Aran, a bounty hunter tasked with infiltrating the planet Zebes to stop the space pirates from exploiting alien creatures known as Metroids for galactic domination. The gameplay was non-linear, allowing players to explore the interconnected areas of Zebes freely. This design choice encouraged backtracking and deep exploration to find power-ups that would enhance Samus's suit and grant abilities to access previously unreachable areas. Metroid was groundbreaking for its time, combining the platforming of Super Mario Bros. with the exploration and item progression of The Legend of Zelda. This unique combination gave birth to the Metroidvania genre, named after Metroid, and the later Castlevania, Symphony of the Night, which followed a similar design philosophy. Another significant aspect of Metroid was its narrative twist. Throughout the game, Samus Aran was depicted in a gender-neutral suit of armor, leading many players to assume the protagonist was male. However, completing the game within a certain time frame revealed Samus to be a woman, a dramatic reveal that challenged the then-male-dominated landscape of video game characters. Metroid was a success, earning acclaim for its atmospheric gameplay, innovative design, and the surprising revelation of its protagonist. The game spawned numerous sequels across various Nintendo platforms, each expanding the series' lore, refining gameplay mechanics, and continuing Samus Aran's adventures. From its atmospheric exploration to its genre-defining gameplay and its trend-setting protagonist, Metroid, stands as one of Nintendo's most influential creations. It introduced the gaming world to Samus Aran, a pioneering female hero, and a staple of Nintendo's diverse character roster. The influence of Metroid continues to resonate in games today, a testament to its enduring legacy. Chapter 12, Game Boy, Redefining Portable Gaming. Following the success of its home console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo turned its sights to a new frontier, portable gaming. With the release of the Game Boy in 1989, Nintendo ushered in a new era of gaming that would revolutionize the industry and firmly establish Nintendo as a leading innovator in the field. The brainchild of Nintendo engineer Gunpei Yokoi, the Game Boy, was the natural evolution of his earlier game and watch handhelds. Compact, durable, and powered by four AA batteries, the Game Boy offered gamers the chance to take the magic of video games anywhere and everywhere. Its hardware, though simple by today's standards, was groundbreaking at the time. It featured a dot matrix screen, stereo sound through headphones, and most importantly, interchangeable game cartridges. The Game Boy launched with Tetris as a pack-in game in North America, a strategic decision that proved to be a masterstroke. Tetris, with its simple yet addictive gameplay, was the perfect showcase for the Game Boy's capabilities and its potential for pick-up-and-play gaming. This strategic bundling led to the Game Boy and Tetris becoming phenomenally successful, appealing not just to traditional gamers, but also attracting a new, wider demographic to video games. However, Tetris was just the beginning. The Game Boy's library quickly expanded with a variety of games spanning multiple genres. One of the most notable among these was Pokemon Red and Green, Red and Blue in international releases, released in 1996. These games unleashed a cultural phenomenon and were instrumental in extending the Game Boy's lifespan well beyond that of its competitors. One of the Game Boy's key strengths was its robust battery life, a feature that gave it an edge over technologically superior competitors like the Sega Game Gear and the Atari Lynx. While these systems offered color displays and more powerful hardware, they were also more expensive and had a significantly shorter battery life, factors that contributed to the Game Boy's dominance in the handheld market. Over its lifetime, the Game Boy saw several revisions, including the smaller Game Boy Pocket and the Game Boy Lite, which featured a backlit screen. The Game Boy Color, launched in 1998, finally brought a color screen to the Game Boy line while maintaining backward compatibility with all previous Game Boy games. The Game Boy was more than a commercial success. It was a game changer. It brought video games out of the living room and into the wider world, demonstrating the potential of portable gaming. Today, its legacy lives on in the DNA of every handheld gaming device, a testament to Nintendo's ability to innovate and shape the industry. The Game Boy was not just a gaming device, it was a revolution that fit right in the palm of your hand. 
Chapter 13, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, The 16-Bit Leap Forward. As the 1990s dawned, the video game industry was undergoing a significant transformation. The 8-bit era, dominated by the Nintendo Entertainment System, was giving way to a new generation of more powerful 16-bit consoles. Not to be left behind, Nintendo unveiled its answer to the changing gaming landscape, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The SNES, known as the Super Famicom in Japan, was released in 1990 in Japan and South Korea, followed by a North American release in 1991, and in Europe and Australasia in 1992. This 16-bit console was a significant upgrade over the NES, offering improved graphics and sound capabilities that allowed for more complex and visually stunning games. The design philosophy of the SNES was a testament to Nintendo's belief in balancing technological advancements with accessibility. While it was not the most powerful console of its generation, that honor went to the Sega Genesis. The SNES emphasized delivering a robust gaming experience that prioritized fun gameplay and innovative design. Nintendo's faith in this philosophy was quickly rewarded. Despite the early lead of the Sega Genesis in the 16-bit console war, the SNES gradually gained momentum. It was the quality and depth of the SNES's game library, more than any other factor, that solidified its position in the market. The SNES saw the release of many games that are now considered among the greatest of all time. Franchises like Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, and Final Fantasy saw landmark entries on the SNES, pushing the boundaries of gameplay, storytelling, and artistry in video games. Super Mario World, the SNES's launch title, introduced players to the vibrant and expansive Dinosaur Land, marking the first appearance of Mario's dinosaur companion, Yoshi. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, returned to the top-down perspective of the original game, refining the formula and delivering an adventure that many fans consider one of the best in the series. The SNES was also home to Super Metroid, which took the exploration-based gameplay of its predecessors and infused it with atmospheric storytelling, a haunting score, and non-linear gameplay. It was on the SNES that the Final Fantasy series hit its stride, particularly with Final Fantasy IV, known as Final Fantasy III in North America, often cited as one of the greatest role-playing games of all time. The SNES wasn't just a home for great games, it was also a platform for technological innovation. It introduced Mode 7, a form of texture mapping that gave games a unique pseudo-3D look. Games like F-Zero and Super Mario Kart employed this to great effect, creating immersive, fast-paced racing experiences that were unlike anything seen before. As the curtain fell on the 16-bit era, the SNES emerged victorious, selling over 49 million units worldwide. Its legacy, however, goes beyond sales figures. The SNES helped shape the face of gaming, pushing the medium forward and setting a high bar for quality and creativity, a bar that Nintendo continues to strive for today. Chapter 14, Introduction of Yoshi, Expanding the Mario Universe. As the 1990s began, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, SNES, was already home to a host of revolutionary titles, but Nintendo had more tricks up its sleeve. The company aimed to expand the beloved universe of its mascot, Mario, with a character that was not only adorable, but also innovative in gameplay mechanics. The result was Yoshi, the lovable green dinosaur who quickly became one of the most iconic characters in the Mario franchise. The concept of Yoshi can be traced back to the early days of the Mario series. Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Super Mario Bros., originally wanted Mario to ride a dinosaur in Super Mario Bros. 3 for the NES. However, technical limitations of the 8-bit console made this idea impossible to implement at the time. With the advent of the 16-bit SNES, these limitations no longer existed, and Miyamoto's dream could finally come to fruition. Yoshi made his first appearance in Super Mario World in 1990. As a faithful sidekick to Mario, Yoshi could eat most enemies and gain special abilities by eating shells of different colors. His introduction brought a new dynamic to the gameplay, adding more depth and complexity. The innovative mechanic of a secondary character who could be ridden on and interacted with the game environment in unique ways was a standout feature, setting Super Mario World apart from previous entries in the series. After his debut, Yoshi quickly became a fan favorite, resulting in his starring role in the 1995 game Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. In this prequel to the Mario series, 
players controlled Yoshi as he carried a baby Mario on his back, traversing a hand-drawn world that represented a significant departure in visual style from previous Mario games. Yoshi's Island was critically acclaimed for its unique art style, intricate level design, and clever platforming mechanics. Yoshi's appeal extended beyond the mainline Mario games. The character became a fixture in numerous spin-offs, from racing games like Mario Kart, sports titles like Mario Tennis, to party games like Mario Party. Yoshi even headlined his own series of games, including puzzle games like Yoshi's Cookie and platformers like Yoshi's Story. Over the years, Yoshi has remained a beloved character in the Nintendo roster, symbolizing the company's commitment to innovation and its ability to seamlessly blend gameplay and character design. From his memorable debut in Super Mario World to his ongoing appearances in various Nintendo franchises, Yoshi represents Nintendo's creative spirit, bringing joy to millions of players worldwide with his unique abilities and charming personality. Chapter 15, The Pokemon Phenomenon, Gotta Catch Em All. In the mid-1990s, a new franchise burst onto the scene and quickly captured the hearts and minds of gamers around the world. That franchise was Pokemon. Combining addictive gameplay, charming characters, and a compelling narrative, Pokemon not only became a mainstay in Nintendo's portfolio, but also a global cultural phenomenon. The inception of Pokemon was driven by Satoshi Tajiri's childhood love for collecting insects. In an era when urbanization was rapidly encroaching on rural areas, Tajiri aimed to recreate his experiences of nature and exploration for younger generations. Inspired by the idea of capturing and collecting creatures, Tajiri and illustrator Ken Sugimori created the original 151 Pokemon, Launched in 1996 in Japan for the Game Boy, Pokemon Red and Green, later known as Pokemon Red and Blue for international release, provided players with a unique RPG experience. The gameplay centered around capturing and training a variety of creatures called Pokemon and battling them against others. The game's tagline, Gotta Catch Em All, reflected its core mechanic. The collecting and trading of Pokemon to complete your Pokedex, a comprehensive Pokemon encyclopedia. The games were an instant hit in Japan, sparking a nationwide craze. Sensing an opportunity, Nintendo, in collaboration with Game Freak and Creatures, established the Pokemon Company in 1998. Later that year, Pokemon Red and Blue were released in North America, igniting a similar frenzy and marking the beginning of a global phenomenon. The success of the Pokemon games was quickly followed by an animated television series, trading card games, movies, merchandise, and more, cementing Pokemon's place in popular culture. Characters like Pikachu, Bulbasaur, Charizard, and many others became household names. The television series, featuring Ash Ketchum and his trusty Pikachu, further popularized the franchise and introduced Pokemon to those who hadn't played the games. Beyond the original red and blue versions, the Pokemon series continued to evolve, with new games introducing new regions to explore, new mechanics, and new Pokemon to capture. Titles like Pokemon Yellow, Gold and Silver, Ruby and Sapphire, and many more, graced various Nintendo handheld consoles, each bringing innovative features and expanding the Pokemon universe. In 2016, the franchise took another significant step with the release of Pokemon Go a mobile game that used augmented reality to bring Pokemon into the real world. Developed by Niantic in collaboration with Nintendo and the Pokemon Company, Pokemon Go became a cultural phenomenon, encouraging players to explore their surroundings to catch Pokemon. The Pokemon franchise, with its vast array of video games, TV shows, movies, and merchandise, showcases Nintendo's ability to create engaging, expansive universes that players and fans can immerse themselves in. As of today, with over 800 Pokemon species across multiple generations, the franchise remains a vital part of Nintendo's portfolio and continues to captivate fans around the world. Upholding the dream of Satoshi Tajiri and the enduring appeal of the world of Pokemon. Chapter 16, N64, The Dawn of 3D Gaming. The mid-1990s marked a transformative period in the video game industry. The era of 2D gaming was making way for a new dimension, a leap from sprite-based graphics to polygonal 3D. This shift required new hardware capable of rendering complex 3D environments and characters, and Nintendo stepped up to this challenge with the release of the Nintendo 64 in 1996. Named for its 64-bit central processing unit, the Nintendo 64 was a game-changer. 
Its advanced graphics and audio capabilities, coupled with its innovative controller design, ushered in a new era of immersive, interactive gaming. The controller, with its unique M-shaped design, introduced several novel features, most notably the analog stick. This stick allowed for 360-degree movement, a vast improvement over the standard D-pad, providing players with a new level of control in 3D space. The controller also included four C buttons used for camera control in many games, and a port at the back for accessories such as the Rumble Pack, which provided force feedback, enhancing the tactile experience of gameplay. Nintendo understood that compelling software drives hardware sales, and the N64 had a stellar lineup of games right from the start. Nintendo's first-party titles in particular demonstrated the full potential of the console. The most prominent among these was Super Mario 64. As Nintendo's flagship game for the N64, it took the familiar world of Mario and successfully translated it into a 3D environment. It was an instant success, praised for its open-world design, smooth controls, and the freedom it offered players. The game set new standards for 3D platformers and is widely considered one of the greatest video games of all time. Hot on the heels of Super Mario 64 was The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. This game not only reinvented the Zelda series for a 3D landscape, but also had a profound impact on the action-adventure genre. Ocarina of Time boasted an epic storyline, rich gameplay, and a vast, detailed world, capturing the hearts of fans and critics alike. The N64 was also known for its multiplayer experiences, with games like Mario Kart 64, Super Smash Bros., and GoldenEye, providing competitive fun for up to four players, a feature made possible by the console's four built-in controller ports. While the N64 didn't achieve the sales numbers of the Sony PlayStation, which dominated the market at the time, it left an indelible mark on the industry. The console's emphasis on 3D gaming, its innovative controller design, and its legendary game library pushed the boundaries of what was possible in video gaming. The N64 played a pivotal role in shaping the future of the industry, and its influence is still felt in the games and consoles of today. Chapter 17, Super Mario 64, Pioneering 3D Platforming. Released in 1996 alongside the launch of the Nintendo 64, Super Mario 64 was a revolutionary title that took the familiar world of Mario and flawlessly translated it into three dimensions. It was not merely a new Mario game, it was a game that pioneered 3D platforming and set the standards for the genre for years to come. The game introduced players to a fully realized 3D mushroom kingdom, presenting a playground of sorts filled with diverse environments to explore. It traded linear side-scrolling levels of past games for large, expansive stages. Each stage in the game was a contained world, complete with its unique landscapes, challenges, and collection of stars to obtain. Mario's moveset had been significantly expanded from the previous 2D iterations, making use of the new controller's analog stick. In addition to running and jumping, Mario could now perform a plethora of new moves, such as a triple jump, wall jump, and ground pound. He could also swim, climb, and even fly, providing a level of depth and freedom of movement unprecedented at the time. One of the game's innovative features was its dynamic camera system, controlled by the C buttons on the N64 controller. This system allowed players to adjust the camera angle to get a better view of their surroundings, a necessary feature in the game's complex 3D environments. Super Mario 64 also employed a non-linear approach to gameplay. The castle, which served as the game's central hub, was filled with paintings that led Mario to different worlds. But players could choose the order in which they tackled these worlds, and even the order of objectives within each world, thanks to the star-based progression system. This combination of an immersive 3D environment, precision controls, and non-linear gameplay resulted in a deeply engaging game that captivated players worldwide. Super Mario 64 received critical acclaim, with reviewers lauding its technical achievements and gameplay mechanics. It was a commercial success, selling over 11 million copies and becoming the best-selling N64 game. Super Mario 64 revolutionized the platforming genre. It laid the blueprint for 3D platformers and influenced numerous games that followed, from Banjo-Kazooie to Ratchet & Clank. It demonstrated how to navigate and interact with a 3D world effectively, offering lessons in level design, camera control, and character movement that developers still draw upon to this day. Super Mario 64 is a testament to Nintendo's ability to innovate and redefine game genres. 
It showcased the potential of 3D gaming and set the stage for the next generation of video games. More than just a game, Super Mario 64 is a landmark in video game history. Chapter 18, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, a timeless masterpiece. In November 1998, Nintendo released The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the N64, a game that would go on to be hailed as one of the greatest video games of all time. It wasn't the first game in the series, but it was the first to transition the franchise into a 3D environment, and it did so with a level of grace, innovation, and storytelling that has rarely been matched. Drawing from the same well of high fantasy as previous Zelda games, Ocarina of Time presented a story that was both epic in scope and deeply personal. Players assumed the role of Link, a young boy from Kokiri Forest, who is tasked with preventing the malevolent Ganondorf from obtaining the Triforce, a powerful artifact capable of granting any wish. Ocarina of Time took the series' core exploration and puzzle-solving gameplay and translated it into a fully 3D world, made possible by the technical capabilities of the N64. It preserved the sense of adventure and discovery intrinsic to the Zelda series, while introducing new mechanics that added depth to the combat and exploration. The game featured a lock-on combat system known as C-Targeting, which allowed players to focus on specific enemies during fights, adding a level of precision to the combat that was critical in the 3D space. It also introduced Epona, Link's horse, a companion that players could summon to traverse the vast land of Hyrule quickly. One of the game's defining features was the titular ocarina, a musical instrument that Link uses throughout his journey. By learning and playing specific melodies, players could trigger certain events, solve puzzles, and even manipulate time. The mechanic added a unique layer of interactivity and immersion to the game, making the ocarina an unforgettable item in Zelda history. Time travel played a central role in the game, with Link able to move between his childhood and adulthood. This added a narrative depth and complexity to the game, as actions taken in the past affected the future, leading to a dynamic and evolving game world. Ocarina of Time received universal acclaim upon its release. Critics praised its intricate dungeon design, intuitive control scheme, and compelling story. It was also lauded for its atmospheric soundtrack, which played a crucial role in defining the game's distinct sense of place. Selling over 7 million copies worldwide, Ocarina of Time was not only a commercial success, but also a game that left an indelible mark on the industry. It set a new standard for 3D action-adventure games, with its impact seen in countless titles that followed. Games like Dark Souls, The Elder Scrolls, and God of War owe a debt to Ocarina of Time for its innovations in combat, storytelling, and world-building. Today, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time continues to be celebrated for its innovation, design, and storytelling. Its influence on the gaming industry is unquestionable, and its legacy, much like the adventure it encapsulates, remains timeless. Chapter 19, GameCube, A New Direction in Design As the 20th century gave way to the 21st, Nintendo was on the cusp of launching a console that marked a significant departure from its previous systems. The GameCube, released in 2001, showcased a bold new design, robust technical specifications, and a focus on pure gaming that set it apart from its competitors. The GameCube was the first Nintendo console to use optical discs as its primary storage medium. Compact in size, the mini DVD discs offered greater storage capacity than cartridges and were cheaper to produce, though they couldn't hold as much data as the full-size DVDs used by competitors. This shift had several implications. First, it marked an attempt by Nintendo to cultivate better relationships with third-party developers who had often found the cartridge-based N64 difficult and expensive to develop for. Secondly, it emphasized Nintendo's focus on gaming. Unlike the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, which positioned themselves as home entertainment systems capable of playing DVD movies, the GameCube was a dedicated gaming machine. Physically, the GameCube was distinct, living up to its name with its compact, cube-shaped design. It came with a handle emphasizing its portability and was available in various colors, injecting a sense of fun into its aesthetic. The console's controller was also notable. It featured an innovative design with a comfortable grip and well-placed buttons, including a large central A button surrounded by smaller B, X, and Y buttons, two analog sticks, a D-pad, and unique shoulder buttons with both digital and analog input capabilities. GameCube's lineup of games leaned heavily into Nintendo's key franchises, Super Smash Bros. Melee, 
The Legend of Zelda, Wind Waker, Metroid Prime, and Super Mario Sunshine were among the standout titles. The console also saw several successful third-party games, including Resident Evil 4 and Soul Calibur 2, marking a stronger third-party support compared to the N64 era. However, despite its robust capabilities and acclaimed games, the GameCube faced stiff competition from Sony's PlayStation 2 and Microsoft's newcomer console, the Xbox. It ultimately sold fewer units than its rivals, though it was by no means a failure. While not as commercially successful as some of Nintendo's other consoles, the GameCube was a turning point for the company. It demonstrated that Nintendo was willing to innovate and adapt its approach to both console design and game development, setting the stage for the bold steps it would take in the future. In the eyes of many fans and critics, the GameCube represents an era of high-quality game-centric experiences. Its legacy endures in the passionate fan base that continues to celebrate its unique library of games, its innovative controller design, which lives on in the form of the Switch's Pro Controller, and its commitment to prioritizing gameplay above all else. Chapter 20, Super Smash Bros., a crossover sensation. The turn of the millennium ushered in a new era for Nintendo, one that expanded its gaming repertoire into uncharted territories. One of the most significant landmarks of this period was the birth of a crossover sensation, Super Smash Bros. While its first installment was on the Nintendo 64, the series truly blossomed on the GameCube with Super Smash Bros. Melee, a game that took the franchise and the whole concept of crossover fighting games to unprecedented heights. The Super Smash Bros. series was the brainchild of Masahiro Sakurai, a designer at HAL Laboratory, a second-party developer for Nintendo. Sakurai sought to create a fighting game that deviated from the traditional, often complex controls of the genre, opting for a more accessible and intuitive design. The concept was simple yet revolutionary. Instead of trying to deplete your opponent's health bar, the goal was to knock them off the stage. This seemingly minor tweak opened up a world of strategic depth and frenetic action that would become a hallmark of the series. Super Smash Bros. Melee, released in 2001 for the GameCube, expanded on the original game's roster and gameplay mechanics, introducing new modes, stages, and characters. It became a standout title for the console and the best-selling game of its lifespan. What truly set Super Smash Bros. apart was its roster. Characters from diverse Nintendo franchises, Mario, Donkey Kong, Link, Samus, Pikachu, and more, came together for an all-out brawl. Over time, this roster expanded to include other beloved Nintendo characters, as well as guest fighters from other publishers, such as Sonic the Hedgehog, Solid Snake, and even characters from the Street Fighter and Final Fantasy series. This unique approach to character selection turned each game into a celebration of not just Nintendo, but gaming as a whole, it added an extra layer of excitement to each new game's announcement, with fans eagerly speculating on who would join the fight next. Super Smash Bros. significance extends beyond its gameplay and character roster. Its impact on the gaming community has been profound, fostering a vibrant competitive scene. While designed with casual play in mind, the depth of its mechanics and character variety made it a favorite among esports competitors, with Melee in particular remaining a staple at fighting game tournaments. The Super Smash Bros. series embodies a core tenet of Nintendo's philosophy, making games that are easy to pick up and play, but offer deep and engaging experiences for those who wish to master them. It's a testament to the enduring power of Nintendo's character roster and a shining example of the company's knack for innovative game design. The series continues to thrive, with Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for the Nintendo Switch boasting the tagline, Everyone is here! and living up to it by featuring every character from the franchise's history and more, cementing its status as a truly ultimate gaming crossover. Chapter 21, Wii, Motion Controls and Mainstream Appeal. In 2006, Nintendo was ready to shift the paradigm of video gaming once more. It unveiled its latest home console, the Wii. What seemed at first to be a peculiar name would soon become synonymous with a revolution in video game interaction and a monumental step toward making video games a mainstream household activity. Unlike its contemporaries, the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, the Wii wasn't focused on delivering cutting-edge graphics or extensive media features. Nintendo's vision was a system that anyone could pick up and play, regardless of age or gaming experience. The Wii was designed to appeal to a broad demographic, far beyond the typical gaming audience. 
The defining feature of the Wii was its innovative motion control system. Using the Wii Remote, a wireless controller equipped with accelerometer and infrared detection, players could interact with games through physical movements. This feature transformed gaming from a passive to an active experience. Whether it was swinging the controller to emulate a tennis racket in Wii Sports, or aiming it like a pointer to navigate menus, the Wii brought an entirely new level of immersion and intuitiveness to video games. The genius of the Wii wasn't just in its technology, but also in its approach to software. Wii Sports, a collection of five sports games that came bundled with the console, served as the perfect demonstration of the Wii's potential. It was simple, accessible, and fun, appealing not only to gamers, but also to people who had never picked up a controller before. Wii Sports quickly became a cultural phenomenon, making appearances in retirement homes, fitness centers, and late-night talk shows. Beyond its bundled software, the Wii hosted a variety of unique and innovative games that took full advantage of its motion controls. Titles like The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, Super Mario Galaxy, and Metroid Prime 3 Corruption used the Wii Remote in novel ways, providing fresh experiences even in established franchises. The Wii's success was further bolstered by its robust selection of additional features. The Wii menu provided a user-friendly interface where players could access various channels, including a news channel, a forecast channel, and a digital shop where players could download classic games from previous Nintendo consoles. The console also introduced the concept of Mies, customizable avatars that represented the player in games and on the Wii menu. Despite initial skepticism from critics, the Wii became a resounding success, selling over 100 million units worldwide and introducing a whole new generation to video games. The console's legacy is a testament to Nintendo's philosophy of innovation and accessibility. Even as the video game industry pushed toward more complex and realistic experiences, the Wii proved that sometimes the simplest ideas can have the biggest impact. Chapter 22, Wii Fit. Gaming and fitness converge. The success of the Wii and its motion controls opened the doors for Nintendo to experiment with new types of interactive experiences. One such venture was the introduction of Wii Fit in 2007, a fitness game that used a unique peripheral, the Wii Balance Board, to track players' movements and provide real-time feedback. Wii Fit marked a significant shift in the perception and potential uses of video games. It was not just about entertainment, but was designed to promote physical health and well-being. It blurred the line between video gaming and personal fitness, establishing a new genre of fitness gaming that combined exercise routines with interactive gameplay. The balance board was a flat rectangular platform that users stood on to interact with the game. It was capable of measuring a player's weight and center of gravity, tracking shifts in movement and balance. This allowed for a diverse range of activities within the game. Wii Fit was divided into four main categories, yoga, strength training, aerobics, and balance games. Each category had a variety of exercises and mini-games that were both engaging and beneficial for physical health. Whether it was following along with a virtual yoga instructor, doing push-ups, jogging in place, or tightrope walking, each activity was designed to be fun and beneficial for physical health. One of the key aspects of Wii Fit was its approach to personal progression. It included features like a body test to measure a user's body mass index, BMI, and Wii Fit Age, a metric based on a player's BMI, and performance in balance tests. These aspects turned Wii Fit into a personal fitness tracker, enabling players to monitor their progress over time. The release of Wii Fit Plus in 2009 expanded upon the original's success, adding more exercises, customized workout routines, and a calorie burn counter. The game also introduced balance games inspired by popular Nintendo franchises, such as a Super Mario-themed obstacle course and a Punch-Out!-inspired boxing game. Wii Fit was a commercial success, selling over 22 million copies worldwide. Its success spawned numerous imitations and kickstarted a trend of fitness video games. It also influenced the design of future Nintendo products, such as the Wii U's Wii Fit U and the Switch's Ring Fit Adventure. Through Wii Fit, Nintendo not only pioneered a new genre of video games, but also demonstrated the potential of video games as a tool for positive lifestyle changes. Its legacy is a testament to the company's commitment to innovation and expanding the boundaries of what video games can offer. Chapter 23, Nintendo DS, Dual Screens Twice the Fun. After the runaway success of the Game Boy line of handhelds, Nintendo found itself once again standing at the cusp of innovation. 
In 2004, they unveiled the Nintendo DS, a handheld console that stood out from the crowd with its unique dual-screen design. Nintendo's risk in deviating from the norm once again paid off, as the DS family would go on to sell more than 154 million units worldwide, becoming the best-selling handheld console line and the second best-selling console line of all time. The DS's name, short for dual screen, reflected its unique design. Two LCD screens placed vertically, the bottom one being a touch screen. It was a drastic departure from any other handheld on the market, essentially offering two different displays for gameplay. This new interface allowed developers to think outside the box and come up with innovative ways to utilize the two screens. The bottom screen provided a new avenue for interaction via the included stylus. Games could now incorporate touch and swipe mechanics, vastly expanding the range of possible gameplay experiences. Some games use the touchscreen for direct control, others as a secondary display for maps or inventory, and others yet for unique gameplay mechanics. The DS also included a built-in microphone, offering another way for games to interact with the players. This was used in games like Nintendogs, where players could give verbal commands to their virtual pets, and in Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, where players could shout, OBJECTION, into the microphone to interrupt courtroom proceedings. In addition to its innovative hardware features, the DS was also the first Nintendo console to feature built-in wireless capabilities, allowing for local multiplayer games without the need for any cables. Later models would also include Wi-Fi support, paving the way for online multiplayer and digital downloads. The DS line saw several iterations, including the DS Lite, a smaller, lighter version with brighter screens. The DSi, which included two cameras and an SD card slot for expanded storage, and the DSi XL, with larger screens for an enhanced viewing experience. The DS was home to a vast library of games that catered to all kinds of players. Franchises like Pokemon and The Legend of Zelda continued their legacy on the DS, while new IPs like Professor Layton and Brain Age found their start. The console also saw an influx of unique titles that leveraged its dual screens and touch capabilities, such as the rhythm game Elite Beat Agents and the innovative puzzle game Ghost Trick Phantom Detective. The Nintendo DS's impact on the gaming landscape cannot be understated. It expanded the horizons of handheld gaming, introduced new ways to interact with games, and reached a broader audience than ever before. Its dual screen design may have seemed odd at first, but it quickly became a beloved feature that set the DS apart and solidified its place in gaming history. Chapter 24, The Amiibo Boom, Toys Meet Games. Nintendo has a long-standing tradition of merging the physical and the virtual, creating innovative gameplay experiences that blend the lines between the two. One of the most significant examples of this is the introduction of Amiibo, a line of interactive toys that can connect with Nintendo's games and consoles. Amiibo was unveiled during the 2014 Electronic Entertainment Expo. At first glance, these figurines resembled regular collectibles. They represented popular characters from across Nintendo's vast library of franchises, including Mario, Link, Samus, and more. But these were more than mere toys. Each Amiibo contained an NFC chip, near-field communication chip, that allowed it to interact with Nintendo's games and consoles in various ways. Players could simply tap an Amiibo onto the NFC reader of their console, be it the Wii U gamepad, the new Nintendo 3DS, or the Nintendo Switch, to scan the figure into their game. The resulting effects varied significantly across different titles. For example, in Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS, scanning an Amiibo would bring that character into the game as a trainable fighter. In The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, scanning an Amiibo could provide players with useful items and gear. The potential of Amiibo was vast, and developers found creative ways to incorporate them into their games. They could be used to unlock new modes, characters, or items, provide in-game assistance, or even serve as a means of transferring data between games. Each Amiibo could be used across multiple games, increasing their value and versatility. The response to Amiibo was overwhelming. Fans clamored to collect their favorite characters, and the figures quickly became hot commodities. The demand was so high that certain figures became difficult to find, leading to a robust secondary market. Amiibo's success can be attributed to their dual appeal. As high-quality figurines, they appealed to collectors and fans of Nintendo's iconic characters. As interactive game accessories, they provided tangible benefits within the games themselves. This blend of physical and digital interaction was a hit with players of all ages. 
Over the years, the Amiibo line has expanded to include not only more characters, but also different forms. Cards, plush toys, and even cereal boxes have been turned into Amiibo, each with their own in-game functions. The Amiibo line represents Nintendo's innovative spirit and its knack for creating immersive, engaging experiences. It bridges the gap between toys and video games, turning static figurines into interactive companions. The success of Amiibo has left a lasting impact on the gaming industry, paving the way for other companies to explore the potential of toys-to-life products. Chapter 25, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Reinventing an Iconic Franchise. The Legend of Zelda franchise is synonymous with Nintendo, but no entry in the series had as much of an impact on the entire gaming industry as The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Released in 2017 as a launch title for the Nintendo Switch, this game completely reinvented the long-running franchise, blending traditional elements with a whole new level of freedom and exploration. The open-world design was a bold departure from previous Zelda games. Instead of following a linear path with clearly defined dungeons and bosses, Breath of the Wild dropped players into the middle of a vast, beautiful, and dangerous world that they could explore at their own pace. The land of Hyrule was at their fingertips, full of mysteries, puzzles, and dangers. The game's go-anywhere, do-anything philosophy was a revolution, not just for Zelda, but for the entire open-world genre. The core mechanics of the game emphasize survival and creativity. With a wide range of weapons, shields, and other items at their disposal, players could approach challenges in a myriad of ways. This game also introduced environmental physics and a dynamic weather system, which impacted everything from combat to puzzle solving. For example, metal objects could be used to conduct electricity, and fire could create updrafts to lift Link into the sky. From its stunning visual style to its atmospheric sound design, every aspect of Breath of the Wild was meticulously crafted to draw players into its world. The game's minimalist music and ambient sound effects created a sense of immersion and mystery. The art style, which blended realistic and cartoonish elements, brought Hyrule to life like never before. Breath of the Wild's innovative design was met with universal acclaim from players and critics alike. It won numerous Game of the Year awards, and is often cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. The game's impact on the industry was profound, influencing a new generation of open-world games. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild stands as a testament to Nintendo's ability to reinvent its most beloved franchises. By challenging conventions and embracing innovation, Nintendo demonstrated that even after 30 years, The Legend of Zelda could still surprise, captivate, and inspire. This game not only redefined what a Zelda game could be, but also set a new standard for open-world gaming. Chapter 26, The Switch Era, A Hybrid Approach Nintendo has always had a penchant for creating consoles that break the mold. The Nintendo Switch, released in 2017, is no exception. The Switch is a home console, a portable gaming device, and a tablet, all rolled into one. It marks a significant step in Nintendo's console history and represents a harmonious blend of the company's history in both home and handheld consoles. The Nintendo Switch is designed around a central tablet-like unit, the Switch console, with attachable Joy-Con controllers on either side. This console can be used in three different modes, TV mode, tabletop mode, and handheld mode. The flexibility to switch between these modes, hence the name Switch, gives players a level of freedom unseen in previous console generations. TV mode, the most traditional usage, allows the Switch console to be docked and connected to a television for home gaming. In tabletop mode, the console stands on its own using a kickstand, and the Joy-Con controllers can be detached for multiplayer gaming or single-player gaming. Finally, in handheld mode, the Switch functions similarly to Nintendo's previous handheld devices, like the Game Boy or DS, with the Joy-Con controllers attached to either side of the console. The Joy-Con controllers themselves are an innovation. They feature standard buttons and analog sticks, but also house advanced motion sensors, HD rumble, and an IR motion camera, giving them enhanced functionality compared to the Wii's remote, but in a much smaller package. The controllers can be used independently in each hand, together as a single game controller when attached to the Joy-Con grip, or attached to the main console for handheld play. The Joy-Con controller's versatility allows for a wide variety of gameplay styles, making the Switch appealing to a broad audience of gamers. Upon its release, the Nintendo Switch was met with widespread acclaim, both for its innovative design and its strong library of games. 
Many critics and players praised the console's hybrid design, which allows for seamless transition between home and portable play. The launch was bolstered by the release of one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which showcased the capabilities of the new system. The Switch era is characterized by a return to form for Nintendo, with acclaimed new entries in the Zelda, Mario, and Pokemon franchises, a robust lineup of indie games, and successful new IPs like Splatoon 2 and ARMS. The hybrid console also saw the revival of beloved series through titles like Metroid Dread and a range of remastered classics, which appealed to both nostalgic and new gamers. As of 2023, the Nintendo Switch continues to enjoy significant commercial success. It has outpaced sales of Nintendo's previous console, the Wii U, multiple times over, and continues to compete favorably in a market alongside Sony's PlayStation and Microsoft's Xbox. In 2023, the Nintendo Switch saw the release of several notable games, including Detective Pikachu Returns, Super Mario RPG, WarioWare Move It, Garlic, Echo Blade, The Settlers New Allies, and Gimmick Special Edition. By merging the worlds of home console and handheld gaming, the Nintendo Switch represents a significant milestone in Nintendo's history and an exciting glimpse into the future of gaming. Chapter 27. Animal Crossing New Horizons, Gaming in a Pandemic World The 2020 release of Animal Crossing New Horizons for the Nintendo Switch came at an unprecedented moment in global history. As the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the world, many found themselves confined to their homes, cut off from their daily routines and social interactions. Amid this backdrop, Animal Crossing New Horizons provided a soothing, cheerful escape from the grim realities of the outside world thus playing a significant role not only in Nintendo's history, but also in the broader context of global pop culture. The Animal Crossing series, which began on the Nintendo 64 in Japan before finding wider success on the GameCube, is known for its relaxing, non-linear gameplay. Players inhabit a rural village populated with anthropomorphic animals, engaging in activities such as fishing, bug catching, fossil hunting, and decorating their homes. In New Horizons, the series received its most significant overhaul since its inception. Rather than living in an established village, players are whisked off to a deserted island courtesy of the entrepreneurial raccoon, Tom Nook. The setup allowed for greater customization than ever before, with players able to place furniture outside, change the island's terrain, and even determine where villagers' homes would be located. The open-ended gameplay, coupled with a real-time game clock that mirrors the actual time of day and season, offered a uniquely immersive experience. The timing of New Horizons' release, just as global lockdowns were being implemented, was unexpectedly fortuitous. With millions confined to their homes, the game quickly became a social hub. The ability to visit friends' islands through online play provided a virtual space for socialization that was sorely missing in the real world. Many players used the game for everything from birthday parties and weddings to graduations and museum tours, offering a sense of normalcy and connection in a time of widespread isolation. The social impact of Animal Crossing New Horizons was complemented by phenomenal sales. It became one of the best-selling games on the Switch and one of the best-selling video games of all time. The game's success also led to a surge in Switch console sales, with demand so high that shortages were reported worldwide. Animal Crossing New Horizons exemplifies the power of video games as a form of social connection, relaxation, and escapism. Its success underscores Nintendo's ability to create compelling, unique experiences that resonate with players. As a snapshot of a unique moment in time, it stands as a testament to the role video games can play in bringing people together, even in the most challenging circumstances. Chapter 28 the indie revolution, the eShop, and a new wave of games. The 2010s marked an exciting era in the video game industry, the rise of indie games. Independent or indie games are typically created by individuals or small teams without the financial backing of a large game publisher. This independence allows for a high degree of creative freedom, resulting in some of the most innovative and captivating games of recent years. Nintendo embraced this indie revolution in a significant way with its digital distribution service, the Nintendo eShop. Introduced with the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, and later extended to the Nintendo Switch, the eShop has become a haven for indie developers and players seeking unique gaming experiences. The eShop's strength lies in its openness to different types of games. 
Unlike previous Nintendo platforms, which were primarily dominated by first-party and big-budget third-party titles, the eShop created a space where indie games could thrive. It provided a platform for smaller developers to get their games in front of Nintendo's vast audience, opening up opportunities for a wide range of innovative titles that might not have otherwise found a home on console. Some indie games like Celeste, Stardew Valley, Shovel Knight, and Hollow Knight found enormous success on the eShop, garnering critical acclaim and strong sales. These games, with their focus on tight mechanics, engrossing narratives, and distinctive art styles, exemplified the best of what indie games could offer. Nintendo also made a concerted effort to support indie developers. The company held regular Nindie showcases, where upcoming indie games were highlighted. They also worked closely with developers to ensure that their games were as successful as possible on the platform. But it wasn't just about the games. The eShop also introduced new features that benefited players and developers alike. Players had access to a vast library of titles that could be downloaded directly to their console, eliminating the need for physical copies. Developers, on the other hand, had the option of setting their prices and sales, giving them more control over their revenue. The eShop and the indie revolution it helped foster represented a significant shift in Nintendo's strategy. It marked a recognition of the value and potential of indie games and a commitment to providing a diverse range of experiences to players. This initiative not only expanded Nintendo's gaming library, but also reinforced its position as an innovative and inclusive player in the video game industry. Chapter 29, Exploring the Power of Joy-Cons. Nintendo's commitment to innovation is particularly apparent in its controller's design, with each console generation bringing a new approach to player interaction. This tradition continued with the release of the Nintendo Switch and its Joy-Con controllers. The Joy-Con, as the name suggests, is a controller designed to bring joy to the players, and it does so through a combination of versatility, comfort, and advanced technology. The Joy-Con is a prime example of Nintendo's philosophy of flexible gaming. Sold as a pair, these small, detachable controllers can be used independently in each hand, attached to the console for handheld mode, or slid into a grip accessory to mimic a traditional controller. They can also be used as individual controllers, allowing for instant two-player action. Yet, the versatility of the Joy-Cons extends beyond their form factor. Each Joy-Con is packed with advanced technology that opens up a range of gameplay possibilities. They include standard features like an analog stick and an array of buttons, but also more innovative features like an accelerometer and gyro sensor for motion control gaming. Perhaps the most exciting innovation is the inclusion of HD Rumble, a sophisticated haptic feedback system. It can simulate a wide variety of sensations, from the feel of ice cubes clinking in a glass to the sensation of a swarm of bees buzzing inside the controller. This feature adds a whole new dimension to games, making them feel more immersive and realistic. Moreover, the right Joy-Con is equipped with an IR motion camera that can detect the distance, shape, and motion of nearby objects. This feature was notably used in 1-2 Switch, a party game where players competed in a variety of mini-games that showed off the Joy-Con's capabilities. However, the Joy-Con's journey has not been without bumps. The controllers have been criticized for their lacking durability, with some users experiencing what is known as Joy-Con drift, where the analog sticks register movement without any player input. While Nintendo has addressed these issues and offered free repairs, it has been a recurring concern. Despite these issues, the Joy-Con controllers represent Nintendo's enduring commitment to pushing the boundaries of interactive entertainment. Whether it's through their versatile design, their advanced features, or the sheer joy they bring to players, the Joy-Cons have undoubtedly left their mark on the gaming industry, reinforcing Nintendo's reputation as an innovator and trendsetter. Chapter 30, Nintendo's Evolution in Mobile Gaming. The mobile platform has always been a fertile ground for video games. Its explosive growth over the years, driven by the ubiquity of smartphones and tablets, has made it an attractive market for game developers. Initially, Nintendo showed reluctance to enter this market, fearing it would cannibalize their handheld console sales. However, recognizing the potential of this platform, the company made a decisive entry into mobile gaming. Nintendo's first venture into mobile gaming was Mitomo, launched in March 2016. More of a social networking application than a traditional game, Mitomo allowed users to create a Mii character and interact with friends through conversations and minigames. Although not a massive hit, Mitomo demonstrated Nintendo's willingness to experiment in this new territory. 
The company's next mobile venture, Pokemon Go, developed by Niantic and published by the Pokemon Company, in which Nintendo has a significant stake, was released in July 2016. This location-based augmented reality game, which involved catching virtual Pokemon in the real world using smartphone GPS, became a worldwide phenomenon. Pokemon Go was lauded for promoting physical activity and for its novel use of augmented reality, solidifying Nintendo's presence in the mobile market. Building on this success, Nintendo continued to bring its flagship franchises to the mobile platform. Super Mario Run, released later in 2016, brought the classic Mario gameplay to smartphones with a unique control scheme suited for one-handed play. Then came Fire Emblem Heroes and Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, both in 2017, which adapted their respective series gameplay for mobile devices. Each of these games enjoyed varying degrees of success, demonstrating the appeal of Nintendo's properties in the mobile market. In 2018, Nintendo introduced Dragalia Lost, its first original IP for mobile devices. This action RPG, co-developed with Psy Games, proved that Nintendo could not only adapt existing franchises for mobile play, but also create new experiences tailored specifically for the platform. The most recent addition to Nintendo's mobile roster was Mario Kart Tour, released in 2019. This game brought the high-octane racing action of the Mario Kart series to smartphones, complete with a variety of courses, characters, and carts. Despite facing criticism for its microtransaction model, the game has enjoyed considerable success. In 2022, Nintendo reportedly reached a total of $1.8 billion in revenue from its mobile games, which include Super Mario Run, Dr. Mario World, Mario Kart Tour, among others. In June 2023, Mario Kart Tour gained a new city circuit in an upcoming night tour update. However, there are reports suggesting that Nintendo might be stepping away from mobile games. The company's future plans for the mobile gaming landscape remain uncertain, but one can only expect that they will continue to bring their innovative spirit and beloved franchises to our screens, whether they be on consoles or mobile devices. Chapter 31, Future Directions, What's Next for Nintendo? As we stand at the precipice of the future, one can't help but wonder, what's next for Nintendo? A company renowned for its innovation, creativity, and relentless pursuit of fun, Nintendo has always managed to defy expectations and surprise its audience. The first area where Nintendo could potentially make waves is in the world of virtual reality, VR, and augmented reality, AR. While Nintendo has traditionally been reluctant to jump into the VR and AR space, citing concerns about user experience, recent patents and comments from company executives suggest that they are actively exploring these technologies. Will we see new VR and AR experiences from Nintendo in the future? Perhaps a system that combines the company's expertise in hardware design with its creative game development? Only time will tell. Nintendo's foray into the mobile gaming market, as discussed in the previous chapter, is another area to watch. The company has already demonstrated its ability to translate its popular franchises to the mobile platform and to create engaging new IPs. How Nintendo continues to innovate and grow in this space, particularly in relation to its console business, will be fascinating to observe. The potential integration of cloud gaming into Nintendo's strategy is another intriguing possibility. While the company has so far been quiet on this front, the growth of cloud gaming could push Nintendo to explore this technology, potentially leading to new ways of delivering and playing games. In terms of specific game releases, 2023 is set to be an exciting year for Nintendo fans. The company has a lineup of highly anticipated games, including The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Everybody 1-2 Switch, Pikmin 4, and Super Mario Bros. Wonder, among others. As for the Nintendo Switch, while there were hopes for a new iteration of the hardware in 2023, Nintendo's president, Shuntaro Furukawa, confirmed in the company's annual financial report that there are no plans to release a new version this year. However, the future of the Switch remains bright, with the potential for new hardware iterations, expanded services, or even a successor system that carries forward the hybrid concept in the coming years. In fact, some analysts predict that Nintendo's next console, which is not expected to be a simple upgrade of the Switch, could launch as late as 2024. Beyond specific technologies and platforms, the future of Nintendo will undoubtedly involve new games, characters, and experiences. Whether it's the next entries in the Mario, Zelda, or Pokemon franchises, or entirely new IPs, 
These games will continue to embody Nintendo's unique approach to game design, delivering fun and memorable experiences to players. In the end, the future of Nintendo is like one of its games, full of possibilities, surprises, and excitement. As fans and players, we can look forward to the next level in Nintendo's history, ready for the company to once again redefine our expectations of what video games can be. That's it for this quite comprehensive history of arguably the most successful and influential video game company ever. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.